Hello everyone. So I'm once again going mad with curiosity. So it's time to take a look at some of these mystery towers. These all look to be either custom builds or perhaps builds from some really small time manufacturers. And these all look to be mid to late 90s to early 2000s systems. So let's put some more mysteries to rest and tear into these. All right, let's start with this nimble stealth P133. Let's find out just how nimble it really is. You can see this thing went through some tough times. Faceplate is broken up there. This drive bay cover is pushed in, but at least it doesn't look broken. We've got a very nice creative 8-speed CD-ROM drive here, and we're badged as an Intel Pentium 1. Now it appears that Nimble was actually a small-time computer manufacturer, though I cannot find anything on them, so they must have been a very small-time company. And we are unfortunately missing the cover for the reset button. Luckily the switch is still in there, and it seems to be still switching, so at least it'll still work. And here's what makes me think that Nimble was a small-time computer manufacturer. Got a sticker back here with a serial number on it. It must not have been around for very long. But we can see it's an AT system. Got our 25-pin serial port here. Looks like we also have a 9-pin serial port in there. Possibly. Got our parallel port here. Some kind of video card. And some kind of sound card. And a dial-up modem with many, many audio jacks. And just like any old AT system, just slide the outer metal back. And pull it off. And unfortunately we are missing the hard drive, and it looks like it was pretty brutally removed. That metal's pretty bent. I should be able to bend it back though. But luckily the rest of the system is complete, and since all these cables are already disconnected, let's just get them out of there. And there's our CPU, socket 7 Intel Pentium. Let's go ahead and get that out of there. And all the pins look good. Let's just leave this out for now. Interesting choice of RTC module there. I'm so used to seeing either Dallas or Benchmark RTCs. Those RTCs contain an internal battery, and that battery is most likely dead. And unfortunately, that RTC is soldered to the motherboard, but that's no problem. I just hope that module is similar enough to the Dallas RTCs so we can do the battery hack. And there's our 9-pin serial port. Let's get that out of there. All right, let's start with the sound card since it's right there. And it's a Creative CT2980 from 1994. Pretty clean little card. And it has an IDE interface, as opposed to a proprietary bus connector. Now let's check out that video card. And got a very nice PCI Cirrus Logic card. Looks like it's from 1996 or so. Minimally dusty. And last but not least, our gateway to the information superhighway. And it's yet another Cirrus Logic card. Interesting that it still has the little shut up sticker over the piezoelectric buzzer there. I guess this person was using the audio outputs for those high fidelity true tone dial up sounds. Pretty clean little card as well. All right, let's check out that RAM. Now these are all plastic clips, so let's hope they don't break. All right, so far so good. No info on that side. And no info on this side. I am not Googling chip part numbers. Let's check out the other one. And that looks like an identical stick. Always nice to have a matching set. And here's a good shot of the motherboard model number and chipset. And here's a good shot of the system and keyboard BIOS. Hey, this system has onboard USB. Looks like there's just two screws holding this floppy drive in, so let's get it out of there. Okay, apparently not. There is a screw on the other side, it's just really, really loose. Alright, I got that screw out, but it's not wanting to come out the front, so I'm just gonna drop it out the back. There we go. And it's a Neutronics drive, made by Mitsumi, model D353T7. Looks like whatever brutally removed that hard drive did some damage to it. Let's just see if I can put it back in the sorts. Okay, that should work. And not too unclean in here, just minimally dusty. Keep your heads clean. Okay, apparently they were already pretty clean. All right, let's get that creative drive out of there. Now I can snatch that drive bay cover out. And yeah, it's not broken. It does have a bit of a bow in it though. All right, let's knock that dust off. This is the CD Master. AE to be specific, model SCR830, manufactured January 1997. I do unfortunately have a crack in the front face here though. I have to see what can be done about that. And speaking of cracks, I do want to try to rectify this little tragedy here. This might not be the coolest looking case in the world, but I still want to try to fix it. So let's go ahead and get that face plate off. First, let's disconnect it from the motherboard. This seems to be fairly straightforward. Well, except for this tab up here, Seems like it's not bending back far enough to clear the metal. There we go. 
All right, so I want to do a fiberglass repair on this. And the first step to doing that is making sure everything is really clean because if any of that fiberglass resin oozes out of that crack, any dirt that's under it now becomes permanent dirt. So let's get this thing thoroughly cleaned. First, let's get all these components off of it. These LEDs are just held in with hot glue. Let's see if the reset switch comes out that cleanly. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. All right, got that thing cleaned up and I've got it temporarily held together with super glue. Now I'm gonna reinforce it with fiberglass. But before I do that, I'm gonna cover the crack with masking tape. That way, just in case some resin seeps through, it won't get everywhere. Now let's rough up those surfaces. Fiberglass adheres best to a textured surface. And this is the stuff I'm using. It's just regular old hardware store fiberglass. I've already got a piece cut out roughly the size that we need. All right, step one, I just brush a little tiny bit of resin on the inside. I don't have a brush small enough, so I'm using a piece of wire. And just get that everywhere that the fiberglass is gonna make contact. Now at this point, I can just push the fiberglass into place. Now I can take the brush and just saturate it. And I'm not worried about those pieces that are sticking up there. This stuff is really easy to trim once it's cured. All right, that fiberglass repair is all cured up now. So let's go ahead and trim up the excess. Geez, that piece is awfully stubborn. Had to get it with the snips. Now let's get that masking tape off and see if that resin oozed through. Nope, didn't ooze through at all. It's too bad I have nothing to fill in that crack, but it's looking a lot better than it did. All right, let's see if I can tweak this metal back into sorts. Let's just make sure a drive will fit in there because once it's in, the screws will do the rest of the work. And yeah, I think that'll do it. All right, I got that fan off the CPU heatsink and luckily the bearing sounds fine. So I won't have to hurt that nice holographic Intel sticker. And we've got some info on the heatsink itself. All right, got that thing cleaned up. All right, torture test time. Let's see if this power supply has what it takes. Here we go. All right, so far so good. Just give it that five minutes. All right, that is time and we're still alive. Well, figuratively speaking. All right, let's see if we're nimble enough to boot with a dead RTC because it's most likely dead. Power on. And that thing's not even posting. I'm gonna reconnect the speaker and see if it's beeping about anything. Nope, quiet as can be. Well, let's try pulling the video card and see if it complains about that. Nope, this thing has issues. Well, let's see what the post analyzer card says. Okay, well, we get postcodes. Okay, well, all of a sudden it's posting perfectly fine, with the exception of the dead RTC, of course. I didn't get a floppy seek, so let's make sure that's enabled. And yeah, the floppy drive is part of the default CMOS configuration. Well, let's put a DOS boot disk in there and see if it boots. And boot it does. All right, made it to DOS. What say you, creative CD-ROM drive? Okay, well, it tries to open. Can you stay open? Maybe not. Gotcha. No, stay open. At least stay open long enough to where I can wipe out the dust. Oh sure, now that I want it to close, it doesn't. Well, it didn't spin up, so that's a bad sign. Oh, but it works. I thought for sure that thing was gonna be dead. It's very strange that it didn't spin up right off the hop there. Okay, well after giving it some exercise, it does actually stay open now. So I guess this drive is perfectly fine. Now, it's kind of far-fetched to see if Nopix will boot with 16 megs of RAM. But let's see if we can at least make it to the console. Uh-oh. Okay, well either this thing doesn't support a tappy boot, it's not remembering my CMOS settings due to a dead RTC, or it can't read a CDR. Well, let's boot to DOS and rule one of those things out. Okay, so it does read a CDR, but it is not remembering my boot sequence. Yeah, we're gonna have to do something about that RTC. Well, at least I get to demonstrate one of my favorite features of an AT case. Wanna take your motherboard out? No problem. Just remove these two screws and the entire motherboard tray just pulls right out and takes the motherboard with it. Now let's desolder that RTC. Get a bead of flux, both rows of pins. Now work the desoldering alloy in to reduce the melting temperature of the existing solder. 
Now I'll use the desoldering gun to pull that out. And thanks again, James, for providing me with this. And once that's done, we should just be able to pull that off. Just like that. Looks like it is directly compatible with the Dallas and Benchmark RTCs. All right, got that board all cleaned up. Now I'm gonna do what Asus should have done, get a socket in there. So I already checked and there shouldn't be a clearance problem between any ISA cards in this socketed RTC. It comes to just a tiny bit below the ISA slot. I'm not mounting the battery on top. All right, got that soldered on. Now let's haculate that RTC. All right, just like the Dallas RTCs, we're drilling above pins 16 and 20, and that gives us access to the battery terminals. Man, this one actually has pretty big battery terminals. It's gonna make it a lot easier to solder to. All right, that's done. Now I'm just gonna seal it up with some hot glue. Done and done. And as expected, a full length ISA card has no trouble fitting at all. And it doesn't even interfere with the CMOS reset jumper. And I velcroed that RTC battery holder down in a nice readily accessible spot. So let's get a battery in there. All right, let's try it out. Yep, that did the trick. Let's set to boot the CD-ROM. Save and exit setup. All right, Nopix wants to boot. Let's see if it can. I know we're not gonna get KDE. Sure, just continue. Well, I thought that might happen. See, Nopix creates a RAM disk so that it has somewhere to store files temporarily. And apparently 16 megs just ain't enough for that. So obviously that's not happening. And just in case you're screaming at the monitor, you'll be pleased to know that I did in fact install the fourth screw into the floppy drive. And we got no fitment issues whatsoever with the fiberglass repairs. Exactly the way it should be. All right, well this thing made a pretty decent recovery. Too bad it doesn't have a hard drive though. I'm kind of running low on those, at least on those with an appropriate capacity for this system. Oh, and by the way, if you ever encounter one of these nimble systems, just know that the ink on this label is incredibly water soluble. I tried to wash this front panel in my usual way and that ink started coming off the instant the water touched it. I hadn't even put any soap on it yet. But either way, I'm more than happy with how this thing turned out. It's a neat little machine. Let's move on to the next system. All right, next system is this AOPEN custom PC. I'm curious to see if this was actually assembled by AOPEN or if it's just an AOPEN case. See, we've got a CD burner up here. Looks like this is the drive type that actually has the door that flips down when the tray comes out, as opposed to actually staying attached to the disc tray. And if so, I'm really impressed that that door didn't break off. Yeah, it actually looks like it is. I can push on it a little bit and get it to flip out. Very cool. And we can see we're badged as an Intel Pentium 3. Not sure what this Phoenix logo is all about. Might have something to do with the motherboard. I'm not aware of Phoenix BIOS using that logo. And down at the bottom, we have this AOPEN CSI badge. Now, CSI doesn't ring a bell to me. I'm very curious to know what that's all about. And this drive bay cover has a bit of a bow in it. So it's probably the wrong cover for this case. Either that or it's improperly installed. And here's the back side of the machine. You can see it's an ATX system. Got our nice color-coded PS2 keyboard and mouse ports. Onboard USB. Got our two serial ports and a parallel port. Video card has VGA, composite, and S-video outputs. We got some kind of sound card here. Got a dial-up modem and a NIC. I just love that sticker. This modem must have some 3.5 millimeter jacks under there. You can see on the side of the case we have some paint damage here, unfortunately. But at least it's not too bad. All right, let's go ahead and open this thing up. Oh man, that thing's filthy inside. Oh, that's so gross. Look at the size of those dust bunnies. Let's try to get those out of there. This machine was definitely well used, though sadly not well maintained. But fortunately, we do have a hard drive and we can see it's a slot one motherboard. Let's go ahead and get these cables out of the way. There's our CPU. And unfortunately, it looks like the lower part of that bracket is broken. But we can see it's a Cooler Master design. So it's been upgraded from the original Intel cooler. Let's see if we can get it out of there without breaking it any further. And there's that broken piece. Hopefully I'll be able to fix it. Oh, okay, this top piece comes off. I guess it's just there for retention. And there it is. Got a 500 megahertz Intel Pentium 3, 512K a cache, and 100 megahertz front side bus. Fan bearing's quite noisy, but at least the edge connector looks good. Looks like it just needs minimal cleaning. Let's put that to the side. Oh, look at that dust buildup. This mother was gonna need a full bath. All right, let's check out that video card. And it's an ATI Rage 128. It's interesting that it has a little daughter board there for the S-Video and composite outputs. Yeah, it just attaches to the board through that pin header. 
<laughs> this thing is absolutely filthy also. Can't even really see any information. Definitely need to get that cleaned up. All right, let's see that sound card. Now that's interesting. It's actually got an A-Open chipset. I didn't think that A-Open was into manufacturing ICs. I'm gonna have to look into that. Yeah, can't see too much back here either. But at least you have a part number. Got another one to get cleaned up. This could be the filthiest computer I've featured on this channel to date. Let's check out that dial-up modem. And it's a Conexant modem, complete with cobwebs. Yet another devastatingly filthy card. And finally, the NIC. And it's a classic Realtek NIC. Luckily not a whole lot of surface area to collect dust. Let's see what we've got for RAM. And we've got a 128 megabyte PC100 stick. Also filthy. Let's check out the next one. And we've got a 128 meg PC133 stick. Now you can mix and match PC100 and PC133. It doesn't always work out well, but most of the time the PC133 stick will downclock itself to match the PC100 stick. But that doesn't always work out well. But hey, at least the backside's pretty clean. All right, let's get that drive cage out of there. Looks like only three screws and it's out. I love that even though this is an ATX ACPI system, they still used a real ka chunk -ka chunk switch for the power button. Just listen to this thing. And obviously it's not even a latching switch, just an overgrown, normally open, momentary push button. <laughs> I just love it. Speaking of the front panel, let's get that disconnected. Let me knock this dust off so I can actually see what I'm disconnecting. The system must be from the dust planet. All right, let's get this motherboard out of here. Ooh, that screw's not even tight. And this screw wasn't even tight either. Somebody was slacking. Yeah, it seems like none of these are. <laughs> yeah, not a single one of these screws were tight. Let's get you cleaned up. All right, first thing I wanna do is get these CPU brackets off. These brackets actually fold down. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to preserve that folding action on the repaired bracket, but we'll see. And of course, that battery is completely dead, so let's get it off of there. All right, that motherboard is washed, dried, and denastified. Let's get a battery in it. All right, I've got that CPU bracket temporarily held together with super glue. Now, if I'm gonna have any hope of preserving that folding action, I'm only gonna be able to reinforce these on the inner portion. So what I'm gonna do is dremel a groove down the middle of each side, and I'm gonna fill that with epoxy. And hopefully that'll give us some more structural integrity. Reinforcements have arrived. All right, I was able to preserve the folding action of the CPU bracket. All right, let's do something about this CPU heatsink. This thing is a proper mess. Okay, well luckily that fan came off without incident, but just look how disgusting this thing is. This is your reminder to replace your house's air filter. Let's actually get this heatsink off because I wanna refresh the thermal paste anyway. Plus I'm sure it's deep down dusty. Oh yeah, that thermal pad is gone. But surprisingly, not super dusty in here. All right, let's get some fresh paste on that. Now let's get it back together. Yeah, all that dust did no favors for that fan bearing. So let's see if we can fix it up. Let's cut into the label, add our three in one oil, run it till it sounds happy clean it up with IPA, and then seal it up with good old Captain Tape. There we go, much better. And I de-dusted those blades to the best of my ability. There's something about the dust in this system, it's like molecular sized. Microfiber cloth is usually enough, but it's not enough to remove this dust. All right, let's get that CD burner out of there. Well, that's cool, it's an A-Open drive. Model CRW9624. Let's get some of that dust off. And the hard drive is an incredibly dusty 15 gigabyte Max Tor, manufactured February 19th, 2000. Let's get that de-dusted. And we've got an Alps floppy drive, which I'm certain is sorely in need of a deep clean. Let's knock that dust off. Wow, I'm actually surprised it's not more dusty. Let's clean that out. Let's freshen up that grease too. I'm just gonna put a little dab of white lithium grease here then let nature take its course. And of course, let's clean up those heads. Well, just slightly dirty. 
Okay, well, there's nothing too special about this power supply, but it is branded A open, so let's A open it up and see what's going on in there. Wait, you mean to tell me it's incredibly dusty in there? No way. Okay, well, let's start by cleaning this thing out. Clean enough for now. Can you believe those sacrificial hard drives still haven't died? Well, let's see if they die today. Here we go. Apparently not. All right, all voltages look okay. I'll just give that the standard five minutes. All right, five minutes is up. That power supply is good. And you probably already know what I'm about to say. Please use a healthy amount of caution when working inside a power supply. These little guys right here can store quite a nasty charge, and that charge persists even after the thing's been unplugged for a while. So if you're opening up a power supply and you're not careful, prepare to have your day absolutely ruined. Okay, let's see what kind of dusty horrors are living behind this faceplate. Okay, well, it's not as terrible as I was expecting, but still pretty nasty. All right, let's get this faceplate cleaned up. I'm just gonna use the magic eraser. There, that's better. Okay, we got some rust spots of dubious origin on the bottom of this case here. So let's see if old CLR can take care of them. All right, not too bad. Let's just wipe that out with some distilled water so there's no residual CLR nastiness. All right, let's make sure that repaired bracket survives CPU reinsertion. And yep, no trouble at all. All right, time to see what this thing does. Power on. Oh, hard drive initialized. And we are posting. Okay, well, it's not happy about the floppy drive for some reason. The cable is definitely in the correct orientation. Let's just continue for now. All right, we are booting something. Ooh, this looks like NT. Yep, Windows XP. It's got a FAT32 file system. It certainly isn't getting far. That hard drive is thrashing. It doesn't sound particularly healthy. I'm just gonna give it a while and see if it figures its life out. Oh yeah, we're having hard drive problems. I don't know if the mic's picking that up. Oh yeah. That thing is done. Yeah, that thing sounds terrible. Well, bad floppy drive, bad hard drive. How about the CD drive? Oop, doesn't quite want to open there. Come on. You can do it. Yeah, maybe you can't. Not without help. Oh, so close. Come on. That thing's dusty, dusty. Well, let's see if it boots old Nopix. Wow, that drive's so sticky, it won't even close. Well, it didn't spin up. I think we're 0 for 3 on drives in this system. Let this be a lesson to you all. Dust kills computers. So you might want to go check that air filter. <laughs> Floppy drive just made a terrible sound. And yeah, we're not booting to the CD. Well, let's take it apart and see if we can help it. Because there's clearly no helping that hard drive. Ah, screw your warranty. We make our own warranties around here. Gee, wonder why the CD drive doesn't work. Look at that dust. And actually, it looks like the disk mechanism is stuck down. Maybe it'll work if I free it up. Let's see. Yeah, that mechanism's all kind of seized up. Wow, what a mess. Yeah, that's gonna take some cleaning and greasing. All right, cleaned and greased. Let's see what that gets us. I don't have high hopes for this belt, but let's see what it does. Yeah, sounds like that belt's slipping. Yeah, that belt is definitely slipping. Well, this might be the one. Well, let's see. Oh, we're doing stuff. Let's see if it opens. All right, how about closing? Okay, that's a good sign. Let's just clean up that laser lens. Will it spin? That is the question. Oh? Well, it's spinning, but it is ticking. Oh, I think it's spun up. That thing might be working. Let's get it back in there and see. All right, let's try this again.
Okay, well, I'm guessing the rapidly blinking light means anger. Let's see. Yep, no good. Yet somehow, amazingly, the hard drive started working. What in the... <laughs> that's a weird sound scheme. Yeah, we are in. And another thing that's weird, I put that AOL disc back in there, and it sounds like that CD drive spun up. So let's see. Yeah, and it's working. What is the deal with that? What kind of a CD burner can't read CDRs? Let's see what kind of games we got. Ah, oh, just a regular Windows games. Okay, maybe this hard drive just needed a workout. Oh god, Nero. I used to use Nero. I wonder if this drive will burn a CD. Maybe the laser will burn through whatever dust is in there. Okay, well, it recognizes a blank disc. Let's try to burn something. Let's make a data disc. Let's see, let's just find some random crap. Yeah, real player sounds good. Do it. Oh man, I haven't seen this interface in forever. Yeah, it's burning. Oh, nope. Never mind. Oh well. Yeah, still won't read the Nopix disc or any other CDR I have. Oh well. Let's do an error check on that hard drive. This could take forever because this thing is pretty full. Okay, well it didn't complain. Never liked XP's error checking. Would be nice to have just a little something that says, hey, everything's all good. Wow, I am finding date stamps all the way up to 2020. Can't believe someone was still using this computer all that time. Guess that explains all the dust. Alright, let's shut this thing down. <laughs> what was that? Alright, so I decided to dive back into this floppy drive, and I cleaned up and greased the worm gear that actuates the heads. So let's see if we get any different results. Okay, well it sounds better, and we're no longer getting that disk drive error. Might be on to something. Let's see if it boots the DOS. And yes it does! And here we are in DOS. Alright, so that floppy drive is saved. Alright, let's clean up the top of this thing. It's pretty nasty. Just using the magic eraser and some Windex. Alright, well that's as good as that's gonna get. All the remaining marks are actually paint damage. Well, I just love it when a hard drive resurrects itself like that. So apart from a semi-troubled CD burner, this system's perfectly fine. And that drive bay cover is indeed wrong for this case. So I'm gonna have to see if I can hunt down one that's an appropriate color match. But other than that, this system is definitely a special one. I know a lot of people love A-Open systems, and I'm glad I got to save this one. Let's move on to the next system. Alright, next system is this mid-tower machine. See, we have a tape drive here. Looks like a Seagate, and I still don't have tapes for these. But we've got a Philips 2400 series CD burner, and an A-Open DVD burner. And unfortunately, that DVD burner took a pretty nasty hit at some point. Nothing I can do about that. That CD burner is also a little bit brutalized. Not much I can do about that either. And you can see we're badged as an Intel Celeron. Got some jank going on back here. See somebody cut this fan grill out. And the fan that's in there is just kind of dangling there by one screw. But we see it's an ATX system. It has some of the port functions scribbled on there with some homicidal looking handwriting. And for peripheral cards, we've got some kind of dual monitor supporting video card. See we've got the DVI to VGA adapter here. It also has S-Video output. We've got some kind of sound card. We've got a Netgear NIC. And that is quite the USB slash Firewire card. So that gives this machine a total of six USB ports. That's pretty fancy for the time period that this machine is from. And you can see we have a custom side mount fan there. That was definitely cut out by hand. It is not round. And we have a label here that says Mustang. Maybe that was this machine's host name. Makes me think it might have been some kind of janky server. And despite being an ATX case, it opens up just like an old AT system. See what kind of acrobatics I have to do to get that fan disconnected. Uh, of course we don't have a hard drive. Well, that's unfortunate. Another thing that's unfortunate is we seem to be suffering from the capacitor plague. I'm betting every single one of those capacitors is bad. Gotta respect the ingenuity, though. This case fan's actually held on with a wing nut. Complete with bread tie cable management. They even bread tied some cables to the video card. And look at that, we got a free floating system temperature sensor just hanging out there. Yeah, it connects directly to the motherboard. That's cool. Speaking of the video card, let's check that thing out. This screw is already loose. And it is some kind of ATI Radeon from the year 2000. Looks like an RV100 with 32 megs of VRAM. Very nice. 
Let's get that jankified port cover out of there. Hmm, we seem to have some kind of custom case lock or something here. It's just held in with a nut. Let's get that out of there. All right, let's see what we have for sound. Oh, nice, it's a Sound Blaster Live, model CT4670. It's a pretty nice card for this time period. All right, let's check out that Nick. And as we already knew, it's a Netgear Nick. Got the MAC address there. With a big old silkscreen Netgear guy. All right, let's check out that USB Firewire card. Oh, that is quite the card. It even has internal USB and Firewire ports. Very nice. Whoa, does this thing have IDE RAID? Yes, it does. There's the high point chipset. Oh, I am definitely recapping this board. I hope I have enough caps on hand. Let's clear all these cables out of here. See how many IDE channels we have. Yeah, four IDE channels. I am dying to play with that. Can't wait to hear the symphony of multiple IDE hard drives clicking in unison. I'm finding it hard to believe that they have a Celeron running all this. Maybe that was just some kind of theft deterrent sticker. Let's see what's actually under there. Nope, that's a Celeron. And look at the state of the underneath of this heatsink. There's no thermal paste whatsoever. I'd be amazed if that thing still works. Let's pull it out of there. Yep, definitely a Celeron. At least all the pins look good. Let's leave this out for now. Let's see what we have for RAM. All right, looks like it could be a 128 meg PC100 stick. Actually pretty clean. Let's check out the other one. Ah, the jank is real. Mixing PC100 and PC133. Got a 128 meg PC133 stick here. At least the capacities match. All right, I wanna get this motherboard out of here, so let's get this front panel disconnected. Now let's get that temperature sensor off of there. Come here, let's have a look at you. Yeah, those caps are pretty bad. And unfortunately, I do not have any of those values. All of the green puffy leaky ones are 1500 microfarads, and the highest value I have on hand is 1000 microfarads. So this is as far as we're getting with this system. I do not want to attempt to power this thing on with those caps in that condition. Well, I better get some caps ordered. I will experience my IDE hard drive symphony. Rest assured of that. Anyway, here's a good shot of the entire motherboard. It is an A-bit BX133-RAID. And here's a good shot of the BIOS chip. Well, here's another one for the motherboard repair video. That's if I ever get around to making it with that pesky full-time job and all. Yeah, every single electrolytic capacitor on this board is made by JackCon. That is one of the staple brands of the capacitor plague. I do have to stop and appreciate these beautifully long traces here though. That's just pretty. Okay, well, let's test the power supply anyway. Here we go. So far, so good. And yet another five minutes with no smoke show footage. Oh well, at least we have a good power supply. Okay, well we can at least check out and test the components from that system. And here's the Philips CD burner, model PCRW2412, manufactured January 2002. Hey, somebody violated my warranty. And here's the DVD burner. I'm not even gonna try to speak that model number. Manufactured March 2005. And that tape drive is a Connor. Looks like it dates to 1995. It is somewhat dusty. At least the belt has good traction. And the floppy drive is a Mitsumi, model D359M3. Well, it's kind of clean in here. It's very minimal dust. There, all better. All right, in order to test the drives, the video card, sound card, and NIC, I've enlisted the help of System 2. So let's see if that floppy drive can take us to DOS. Power on. Okay, well, no complaints so far. And got a seek. And we're booting. And both CD drives are recognized by the driver. Let's see if they open. Well, the Philips drive does. What's going on with that A open drive? It is stuck. Let's see if it can get unstuck. Oh, it's fighting me. There we go. How about some exercise? Okay, now it doesn't even try. I hear the motor turning, so it's definitely a bad belt. Okay, well, Philips drive it is. And it spun right up. Let's see, that should be R drive. And 
kind of works. Boy, that thing is noisy. That is definitely a high speed drive. Okay, well, let's see if we can finally boot this thing to Nopix. Okay, well, it doesn't sound happy at all about that Nopix disc. It's making some very strange sounds. Okay, well, let's see if it works at all. Nope. Okay, I'm finding that very hard to believe that this is the second CD burner that will read a normal CD but not read a CDR. Well, let's try another CDR. No, it's making those same weird sounds. Yeah, we're still failing to read. That is too weird. Well, my belt kits are failing me on that DVD drive. The original belt's not even perished. It's just out of round. Well, I'm gonna have to put this one on the shelf. However, I'm pretty sure I can get it to work by forcing the mechanism. Let's see. Okay, sounds like it wants to spin up. Let's see if we boot. And looks like it wants to. Yeah, we're booting. But this version of Nopix does not support this graphics card. Let's try an older one. Yeah, it looks like Nopix 7 is doing it. And you probably didn't hear it over that noisy CD drive, but it did play the startup sound. And hey, the NIC is working. And hey, desktop effects are working too. That means 3D acceleration's working, which is good news for that graphics card. Okay, so we confirmed everything I wanted to confirm. Let's shut this thing down. Well, kind of a heartbreaker here. I did minimal cleanup of that faceplate, and it does look a little bit better, but I don't think I'm going to be doing anything with that case. It's just a little too janky for my tastes. But hey, at least we got some pretty good parts, and it's no problem to recap that motherboard once I actually have the caps. Let's move on to the next system. Alright, next system is another mid-tower machine, and the thing that caught my eye about this machine is, that is the very first CD burner that I ever bought. I kind of had to do a double take when I saw it, so I really hope we can get that thing to work. Another remarkable thing is this case still has this little USB door down here. Didn't break off, against all odds. And you can see we're badged as a Pentium 4. And I just love that embossed Sony logo on that floppy drive. Can tell they were proud of that. Maybe that means it's a good one. We've got this powered by Albatron badge. I want to say Albatron was a motherboard manufacturer, but I'm not too sure. And here's the back side of the machine. ATX, of course. Got plenty of provisions for cooling. We've got four USB ports and an onboard NIC, and onboard sound. Wonder if it's any good. See, we've got some kind of video card with DVI, S-Video, and VGA output. And that sound card must be interesting if they're using it instead of the onboard. And we've got a broken Wi-Fi card. And strangely enough, the side of the case has an OEM XP Pro COA sticker. So this must have been put together by some kind of company. All right, let's open this thing up. So that's interesting, the inside of the case has a motherboard diagram. This sure looks like the work of some kind of OEM. Well, no hard drive, but check out that graphics card. It's a GeForce FX something. It would be kind of uncanny if it was a GeForce FX 5200, because that happens to be the very first graphics card that I ever bought brand new. Why do I feel like this machine is speaking to me? And actually, I'm gonna start there. And it is indeed a GeForce FX 5200. Wow, that is just too weird. It's pretty dirty. Let's put that in a safe spot. And it looks like we've got the S-Video to composite adapter down there. <laughs> well, let's see what that sound card's all about. It's got a very strange shape. It's an E3DX chipset. Can't say I'm familiar with that one. No info on the back. I have to look into that. All right, let's check out our broken Wi-Fi card. And it's a classic Linksys Wireless G. You know, I could solder on a new antenna connector. Manufactured September 2006. This might be the newest machine I've featured on this channel. Yeah, it even has SATA. How modern. But it appears even this machine wasn't spared from the capacitor plague. Got a puffy leaky cap there. But look at all the drive bays this case has. I think I found the case that I'm gonna use when I resurrect that IDE RAID motherboard. All right, let's clear these cables out. Well, let's have a look at that Pentium 4. Oof, it took the CPU with it. That thermal grease became thermal glue. Well, that's nothing a little hot air can't solve. There we go. Yeah, I can barely read that. I can see it's 2.6 gigahertz. Let's clean that up. There we go, 2.6 gigahertz, 512K of cache, and 800 megahertz front side bus. 
So modern. Okay, I got the heatsink as clean as it's gonna get. But just look at the amount of dust that's caked up under that fan. And it's like, solid, compact. At least the bearing feels okay. All right, got both of those cleaned up. All right, let's see what we got for RAM. And it's a 512 meg stick, a PC3200 DDR1. Well, that's a channel first. Just a little dusty. Let's check out the other one. And we've got some classic Kingston Convolution. At least I can tell it's probably a 256 meg stick. Not too filthy. All right, let's get this motherboard out of here because it is filthy. And Jackcon strikes again. And luckily that unpinned CPU extraction doesn't appear to have done any damage. You'll have to excuse the background noise, it's getting pretty stormy outside. Now I've had unplanned CPU extractions happen before on PGA478 sockets, and I've never seen it do any damage. And all of the CPU pins look perfectly fine, so I think we're okay. And that Northbridge heatsink is just absolutely huge, and incredibly dusty. Not too surprised that that battery still has some decent charge. This motherboard's a lot newer than what I usually get into. This capacitor here has definitely had it. I'm sure getting roasted by these two MOSFETs all its life didn't do it any favors. All right, that motherboard is cleaned up now. And once again, I don't have any of the values for the bulging capacitors, so we won't be recapping in this video. I definitely need to build up a stock of common capacitor plague values. And here's that CD burner. This thing's about as generic as they come. I don't even know who manufactured it. Let's wipe that dust off. But you can see it was manufactured September 2003, model 5232P. For the sake of time savings, I'm actually gonna bench test this thing. Let's give it some power making some pretty strange sounds. Let's see if it opens. Nope. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> it just needed to think about it for a second, I guess. Let's go ahead and wipe that out. Now, let's see if it spins up. Hmm, that was strange. All right, it spins up. So this thing probably works. Let's see if it'll even open again. Yeah, there it goes. But will it spin up a CDR? And it does. I think that drive is fine. And here's that floppy drive. It's a Sony MPF920, manufactured October 2003. Let's wipe it off. Now there's something clunk a inside there. Sounds like part of a floppy disk. Let's take it apart and see. And yep, that's exactly what it is. Let's try to get that out of there. There we go. I still remember the first time that happened to me. I was probably about seven or eight years old, and I spent about 30 minutes performing frantic surgery with a couple of paper clips to get it out. And from that point on, I always made sure that the slider was flush with the disc, because that's how that happens. The metal ones get bent up just a little bit, and then the floppy drive door gets hooked onto it and rips it right off. All right, let's clean this thing up. And hopefully those heads didn't take any damage from that little incursion, but at least they're clean. All right, let's test that power supply. No smoke. You know, we haven't had a good power supply failure on this channel in a while. What's up with that? All right, this thing's fine. All right, let's see what kind of grossness is behind this faceplate. I've already got all the screws out. Well, it's not too terrible. Let's get that out of there. All right, that cleaned up as well as it could. Weirdly enough, there's this patch of yellowing here and only here. It's very strange. Overall though, I really like this case. It's very lightweight and it's got so many drive bays and it's in really good condition. All right, despite those sketchy capacitors, I wanna see if this thing boots anyway. Got it all back together. Let's see what happens. Okay, it just shut itself off. Let's try again. Okay, now it's posting. Okay, well, let's see if it boots the DOS. And yes, it does. Okay, now we can confirm whether or not that CD drive actually works. And yes, it does. But let's see if it'll read a CDR. Well, it's not spinning up. That's very odd. It spun up on the bench. Let's see. Nope. What in the world is up with that? That is the weirdest failure mode. This is now the third CD burner that'll read a regular CD but won't read a CDR. What's really going on here? Okay, well, obviously we're not getting into Nopix with this drive. Okay, I swapped in one of my known working and known CDR-friendly drives, and Nopix is booting. 
Hey, that's a dual core Pentium 4. Well, we didn't get the Nopic startup sound. But we do have a sound device. Let's see if 3D acceleration's working. And it is. All right, so at least that graphics card is fine. Though it is running quite warm. About 130 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 56 degrees Celsius. That thing is only passively cooled. All right, that's pretty much all I wanted to know about this system. Let's shut this thing down. Honestly, having a look inside this thing kind of raises more questions than answers, at least with regard to its origin. But you know, I'm still kind of tempted to repurpose this case. I really like it. But if it turns out to be something special, then I won't gut it. Well, the capacitor plague finally got me. But that shouldn't be a big deal. We'll get it fixed up and build something cool with it. I'm still thinking about putting it in this case, just because of those massive amount of drive bays. This is kind of the perfect tower for it. And as always, thank you very much for watching, and an especially huge thanks to the fine folks on Patreon. And if you're new to the channel, I'm doing my best to get these videos out every week. And so far, I've been able to keep that schedule, somehow. Although occasionally I've been close to being late, as is the case with this week. But I've got a lot more videos coming, so be sure to subscribe. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.